Hello and welcome to ECG case number six from the paramedicine101.com website and paramedicine101 Facebook site. Um, here's the ECG case scenario that I uh, put up on Facebook. Uh, you respond to a 72 year old female, she's got shortness of breath. She tells you, hey, whenever I get up, I, uh, I get very short of breath. I can't do anything without getting very short of breath. And you look at her and you see that she's breathing pretty fast, she's got pale skin, it's uh, moist to the touch and very cool. And she just, she can't do anything without getting short of breath. So knowing this, even though she's not telling you she has chest pain, we know it's an elderly female. They have atypical presentations for MI very often. You know, it could be an angina equivalent. So we, we, uh, we do an EKG, see if anything's going on. And here's the uh, tracing I gave you. <clears throat> Looking at this tracing, first thing I want you to notice. Uh, first off, I didn't really fool anybody with this. I think most people kind of figured out what was going on. Um, but let's just kind of dissect it a little bit. First thing I want you to notice, it does not say acute MI. The GE Marquette algorithms, uh, pretty good, but you know, it's not perfect, so we still have to interpret this EKG. Uh, it's bradycardic, if you don't believe me, you just look at the rate right there, it says 52. Uh, PR interval is normal, it's less than 200 milliseconds. QR restoration is normal, it's less than 120 milliseconds. QTC, that's also narrow, or, or short, or normal. Uh, the R axis, the QRS axis, is normal at 43. That's the one in the middle there. And you can just quickly look at it and you see that that's all correct. Uh, P waves look upright in all these leads except for in AVR. They are negative as they should be. Okay, so that means it's probably a sinus bradycardia that we're looking at. All right, so let's in interpret this further for any other morphology changes. Um, you might notice that there are some things that don't look normal. For instance, AVL. AVL kind of stands out and so does V2 right next to it. But those leads don't really correlate to each other. Let's just kind of pick them apart separately. So AVL, this morphology in particular, AVL, whenever you see this kind of ST depression, T wave inversion, first thing I want you to do is look over at lead three. And you might be saying, hey Adam, isn't lead one the contiguous lead for AVL? Wouldn't, wouldn't you want to look for changes in lead one? Sure you would, but uh, with this morphology, I want you to look directly over at lead three because lead three is the most reciprocal lead to AVL. Um, and and this, this morphology in particular is very indicative of a uh, acute inferior wall MI. So we're going to look over at lead 3 and sure enough we see uh, some minimal but still present ST elevation right there. Okay, I'm going to get rid of that line so you can see it. It's maybe just about one millimeter. Okay, these T waves, they're very symmetrical. If you draw a line straight down the middle of them, you'll see that they mirror each other. Uh, both sides are, are, are mirror images of, each, uh, of itself, so they're very symmetrical. And whenever you see symmetrical T waves, you should get concerned because it's always a sign of a pathology. Symmetrical T waves are never normal. They don't always indicate MI, but there's something going on. And a hyperacute T wave has a broad base, a wide base, and they're tall and symmetrical. Okay, so this is this is indicative of a hyperacute like T wave, <clears throat> and sure enough, you see them in leads 2 and AVF as well. And maybe AVF has uh, about half a millimeter of ST elevation. So this, this sign in AVL is one of the earliest signs of an inferior wall MI very often. There's, there's not a whole lot of uh, reasons you'll get this ST depression, T wave inversion, this down scooping uh, ST depression. It almost looks like you know if a skateboarder went down this, he'd ramp off the other side, right? So you get used to seeing this change in AVL uh, indicative of an inferior wall MI. So what's going on? Well, also, you do have the ST depression over here. I don't want to skip over lead one. You do have some ST depression in lead one, which is contiguous with AVL. So these are reciprocal changes right here of an inferior wall MI. Okay? What else is going on in the CKG? So we said V2 looks like it's changed, but that has nothing to do with, with the, inf the lateral leads. It's certainly not reciprocal to the inferior leads. So what's going on? Well, I want you to imagine the posterior wall being elevated when you see ST depression in V1, V2, especially in the accompaniment of an inferior wall MI. So this, this change you see in V2, often you'll see it in V1 and V2. Sometimes you'll see it all the way to V4. You'll see this ST depression T wave inversion. Uh, the T wave is almost biphasic here. It's starting to invert. And this ST depression, it's indicative of a posterior wall infarct. It's actually a reciprocal change of the posterior wall. Now, it's not always true that 
if, if, the, if you see this, that it's a posterior wall infarct, you can do a posterior 12 lead. And I would say if all you have is ST depression V1 and V2 without inferior wall changes, I would say do the posterior 12 lead. And uh, what you would do is you would take V4 through V6, V6, and you would continue those basically around the patient's back. So you would put V, v uh, V4 uh, on the back, on the left, left anterior axillary or posterior axillary line, okay, and then you'd find your scapula. So if this was your, if this was your scapula, you'd put V4 right there, V5 right there, and then V6 you could put, you know, just outside, we call it paraspinal, just outside the spine there, and you would get leads, instead of V4, V5, and V6, you'd get V7, V8, and V9, okay? We, we did not do a posterior 12 lead for this case, um, but just in case you see that in the future, if you see some ST depression in V1 and V2, maybe some T wave inversion, uh, maybe even tall R waves, because tall R waves could be posterior Q waves. And here's what I mean. I want you to take a look at this image uh, on this next slide here. And you'll see I've flipped this, this V1, V2. It, I've flipped it, okay? So it's been flipped upside down. Let me use a better color so I can kind of explain. I've flipped it. And you can see now V2 is on top because of doing that. But you can also see that it's elevated, right? Um, and, and what was an R wave has now become a Q wave. Okay, so that, that's just a, a quick way of looking at it. You could take your 12 lead, turn it upside down, all right, and look at it from the back in a light, and you might be able to see the ST elevation. But you should just be able to imagine it in your head when you see something like this in V2 that that is posterior ST elevation. Okay, or do the posterior 12 lead. And uh, here's why. Here's what happens. With an inferior wall MI, generally, it's the inferior wall of the left ventricle, and generally it's because of a right coronary artery occlusion. Okay, so the right coronary artery comes off the base of the aorta. It cut, follows the coronary sulcus right here in between the right atrium and right ventricle. Okay, and then it comes down here as a branch, mar marginal branch, and it feeds this inferior wall. It also continues around, so look over, this is the posterior, this is the anterior over here. So this posterior side, you'll see that the right coronary artery now, because we're looking at it backwards, it's on this side, it comes around and then it feeds the posterior descending artery, and this happens in pr approximately 85% of people, okay? And the other 15%, it's from the left circumflex. I guess there is a small percentage where they have an anastomosis where the left circumflex comes around and the right coronary artery comes around. This would be the best case scenario. They both connect and form the posterior descending artery. But generally, it's, it's from the right coronary artery, so you'll get a lot of uh, inferior wall MIs that have posterior wall involvement because it's a proximal RCA occlusion, um, and so they're not getting inf the inferior wall fed, and they're not getting the posterior wall fed uh, oxygenated blood. So that would be a really bad case. Um, but you can, that's called a dominant RCA. When the RCA uh, supplies the posterior descending artery, the PDA, that's called the dominant RCA. And coincidentally, when, when the left circumflex comes around and supplies the uh, posterior descending artery, that's called a dominant left circumflex. All right, so we continued on with this case and got another 12 lead uh, from the uh, crew that ran the case. And sure enough, the, the next 12 lead called it an acute MI. It is an inferior wall MI. If you look at the ST elevation, you can see it mostly in lead three a little bit in AVF. You do have the reciprocal changes here in the high lateral leads. Remember, AVL, this is a very common finding right here for an inferior wall MI. Sometimes this is the first thing you'll find right here in AVL, okay? And sometimes this is the first thing you'll find over here is the changes in the posterior leads. So that's why you should know how to do a posterior 12 lead just in case. This is also indicative of a right ventricular infarct. I just showed you how the... Uh, the right coronary artery feeds the entire right side of the heart and the, the inferior wall of the left ventricle. But a right ventricular infarct we know is kind of bad because it's preload dependent very often. You'll have a right, somebody that has a right ventricular infarct and they're, they're, they're hypotense. So you can't give them nitrates. Or if you do give them nitrates, they become hypotense and you've got to load them up with fluids because they're very preload dependent. Give those people fluids. Basically, the right side of the heart becomes a conduit and everything coming out is entirely dependent on what goes in. There's not a whole lot of contraction there. So uh, when you see ST elevation in lead three, in lead three, that is greater 
than what you see in lead two, that is indicative of a right-sided infarct. And here's why. If this is your heart, and this is going to be a very ugly picture, lead three is over here, lead two is over here, and we look from our positive electrode. So lead two is looking more up on the left side, and lead three is looking more on the right. It's kind of a quick explanation, but lead three looks a little bit more to the right than lead two, so that's why if you have ST elevation a little bit greater in lead three than in lead two, that's indicative of a right ventricular infarct. And you can do a right-sided 12V to convert, confirm that. Uh, for a right-sided 12V, you would take V4, and you would move it exactly in the same spot it's in, but over to the right side of, of the chest. So if this was your patient's chest here, all right, kind of give them a weird-looking body. This was their chest, and this is where you had V4 here. Well, you would simply just move it over here and put it right there. Okay, I know it's a kind of a weird picture. So what I've done is I've taken the old 12 lead, so this here, this here, and this here is the old 12 lead, and I've superimposed it onto the new one so we can see if there was any significant changes. There isn't a whole lot, but what I want you to note is that this ST segment, especially in lead three, is starting to flatten out. And that is very common as, you know, uh, what will happen, the flatter the ST segment, the more indicative it is of an MI and not something like early repolarization or acute pericarditis. So when you start to see it flatten out like that, it's going to end up something like that, it, it is a lot more indicative of, a, of an MI than of some benign cause. So that's why I kind of showed you, I wanted to show a little bit of a change there. It happened in AVF as well. You see it's a little bit flatter than, than this old one here. Um, not a whole lot of change, but it wasn't a whole lot of time in between the two EKGs. So that's it. I just wanted to go over this case with you. It's an inferior wall MI. So you have an inferior wall MI. You have reciprocal changes in the high lateral leads over here, reciprocal changes. Um, and then you have probably posterior wall extension, okay? Posterior wall extension and probably a right ventricular infarct as well. Okay, so that's all. I'll see you on the next case. Have a good one.